the polar regions, ice-locked repositories of time, where, over vast, still secret places of our Earth, stand guard the screaming winds and the thousand knives of sub-zero gales. The smothering mantle of ice and snow, the glittering crystalline shields, remnants of a force that once shaped the face of more than half the globe. In the Arctic North, a series of ocean basins whose depths can be measured in miles. A region of vast white plains of floating ice. Sometimes flat, stretching off to the horizon. Sometimes crisscrossed by jumbled ice hummocks, long shadowed, flung up by the enormous pressures of the expanding pack. From the edge of the glaciers of these northern coasts, ice mountains thunder into the seas to float in silent, ice-ringed lagoons, finally to make their way southward in solemn, isolated majesty within the frigid ocean currents of the world. Far to the south, an entire world away, is the Antarctic continent, a region of forbidding ice-rimmed mountain peaks. Of glaciers thousands of feet thick, whose weight depresses the surface of part of that continent more than a mile. mass nearly twice the size of the United States, from whose borders great masses of ice extend for miles over the surface of the ocean in winter. Where ice cliffs tower almost a hundred feet over the coastal waves. Where icebergs are great flat plateaus, sometimes a hundred miles long, where inland, winds reach 200 miles per hour, while temperatures drop to 125 degrees below zero. Yet here, even in these regions of barren whiteness, there is life. And just under the ocean surface, lies one of the world's greatest concentrations of sea life. There was a time, and not very long ago, when one man, or two or three together, were leading the way. The names of these men shine like beacons over the polar regions. Wilkes, Nansen, Scott, Amundsen, Shackleton, Bird, and Peary. Names that call upon others, even today, to come to the places of perpetual cold and snow and push outward the limits of the trails the early explorers blazed.
Today, men come as scientists, oceanographers, gathering information for all mankind about the earth and the sky and the oceans. They study the ice, the surface atmosphere, and the deep sea currents. They study the contours of the ocean floor and sample the sediment that has accumulated in the depths. They learn how sound waves travel in ice and cold water for more effective sonar, where a submarine may surface in the Arctic waters, or where it may hide safely beneath the ice cover. They search out the undersea canyons that will allow a sub to pass beneath a heavy ice canopy. Oceanographers studied the life cycles of fishes found in the polar oceans. And the tiny marine organisms on which the entire food chain of the seas depends. Why should these organisms be so abundant here? Does the current bring up some particular nutrient from the depths at this point? Since only a few miles away, the waters are barren. Why is the sediment many feet thick in one area, while in nearby regions there is scarcely any at all? Why are the remains of subtropical forests and fossils of warm water marine life found in the rocks of Antarctica? Has the gradual drift of the Earth's crust brought this continent from warmer regions? There are other mysteries too whose answers may point the way toward new understanding for man. A Weddell seal can remain without air for about 15 minutes. The seals are able to travel many miles under the ice using a series of breathing holes. How does a seal locate a breathing hole in a vast plain of ice? How do whales dive hundreds of feet in seconds and withstand the enormous changes in pressure? How can man himself live for months of darkness in a region that appears to belong to another planet rather than to the Earth? polar regions, where oceanographers, explorers, scientists, and engineers hazard their lives to wrest the prize of scientific knowledge from the still secret places of the Earth. Where today, massed armadas of nations assault the frozen waste. On the Antarctic continent each summer, scientists and their supporting personnel come from the United States and from other nations. As soon as aircraft runways and channels through the ice are cleared, the Navy brings in the tons of equipment needed each Antarctic spring to permit men to live and work in these hostile regions. New Zealand cooperates closely with the United States in scientific and logistic programs. At McMurdo Sound, the Naval Support Forces Antarctic maintains a base, which serves as the staging ground. Throughout the summer season, more than a thousand men, civilian scientists and technicians, as well as Navy support personnel, are quartered here. Scientists carry out their research projects, supported by the National Science Foundation. Each year, penetrating farther into unexplored regions of a continent, where mere survival is a major accomplishment. At the opposite end of the world is the Arctic Ocean, opposite too in geographic features 
For the Arctic has no continental mass. Rather, it is five and a half million square miles of ice-covered ocean. At Point Barrow, Alaska, the Navy Arctic Research Laboratory of the Office of Naval Research is the center for many of the United States Arctic programs. The University of Alaska administers the laboratory under a Navy grant. Other Navy grants bring scientists of many disciplines to gain new knowledge about the Arctic. Director of Arctic programs for the Office of Naval Research is Dr. Max Britton. The program is heavily oriented toward all aspects of oceanography, whether they be physical, chemical, or biological. Operating from Point Barrow, research is extended for hundreds of miles on land and more than a thousand miles into the Arctic Basin. The drifting stations constitute perhaps the most exciting aspect of the research program. Drifting ice islands are great sections of shelf ice broken away from land bordering the Arctic and floating along in the ocean's ice pack. On ice island T3, oceanographers are forcing the ocean to surrender many of its valuable secrets. More is learned about increasing the world's food supply from studies like those of Dr. Tom English of the University of Washington. I'm interested in the distribution and abundance of plants and animals in the sea. The seasons in the sea and the various food chains and food webs. T3 is simply an oceanographic research vessel. I might add that it's the world's most elegant research vessel. We can make sustained observations over periods of months and even as it's now turned out over many years. Experiments on underwater sound are of special concern to the Navy. For the effectiveness of sonar depends upon a knowledge of underwater acoustics in the operating area. Scientists collect marine organisms from the ocean depths to learn more about their effect on sonar. Dr. Kenneth Hunkins of Columbia University is conducting research on the shape and structure of the Arctic Ocean bottom, the drift of the ice, and the dynamics of water mass movements to find out how the ocean currents move and the various scales of motion, particularly the motions that change with time. Core samples of the sediment on the ocean bottom provide a chronological record of ice age periods in the Arctic Ocean. And since the Arctic is believed to be a key factor in the history of the climate of the Earth, exhaustive analysis of these samples can provide answers as to how ice ages come and go, and just what does happen during these periods. Only part of the oceanographer's mission can be carried out from ice islands. For much of his work within the polar ice packs, he relies on Coast Guard icebreakers to get to locations that would otherwise be inaccessible. Navy helicopters are sent ahead of the icebreaker on reconnaissance missions, seeking out open water and the fastest possible route. Oceanographers often endure bitter weather conditions in their continuous search to fill in the many gaps in man's knowledge about the sea. They are found on almost every type of structure that moves over, under, or through the polar seas. The nuclear submarine 
with its capacity to remain under the polar ice for months at a time, can provide the oceanographer with a uniquely valuable platform for his studies. Rear Admiral J.F. Calvert was commanding officer on two of the pioneer submarine cruises to the North Pole. The early operations of the Skate and Nautilus were really the Kitty Hawk operations of Arctic submarining. It was necessary for us to get much better information on the bathymetry of the Arctic. The contour of the bottom is very important to submarines. We needed meteorological information, and we needed information on the ice cover and its characteristics, how it shifted with winds to determine whether or not we might develop techniques to predict those areas in which we might find the most frequent openings in the ice cover. Oceanographic studies are also conducted from far above the Earth. Visual reconnaissance by trained naval oceanographic office ice observers and aerial photographs reveal valuable information about ice conditions. Side-looking radar pierces through as much as 20,000 feet of cloud cover to record surface conditions. Optical lasers determine the profile or ridge height of the ice canopy and are being developed to measure sea ice thickness. No region is too forbidding for the gathering of ocean data. At Fairway Rock in the Bering Straits, undersea instruments continually measure the movements of racing currents. Yet the gathering of raw data in the field is only the beginning of oceanographic studies. The information is then brought back to the research centers and scientific laboratories for analysis and evaluation. At Stanford Research Institute, Dr. Thomas Poulter studies recordings made of marine mammals under the ice. As we bring the tape back to the laboratory from our recordings in the field, We'll usually scan through it to delete any bad ice noise or background noise. And the recordings under the ice has added a new dimension to the recording of marine mammals. There is a lot of cross-feeding from one program to the other. We're doing a lot of work here at the laboratory with blind people. Blind subjects can detect the presence of an object. If they take a circle, a square, and a triangle, experiment with each one of them, they can tell us in a matter of just a few seconds which it is because of the difference in the echo from the different shapes of targets. At the University of Alaska, Dr. Vera Bio analyzes seawater samples from the Arctic. One aspect that we are working on is that of nutrient cycles. Now these nutrients are substances that are required by plants for growth and therefore ultimately they're necessary for all life in the sea. One of the interesting things that has been apparent recently is that the ice cover, far from hindering production, tends to help it along a bit because it provides stability. Studies into the relationships of polar environments to their animal population are directed by McGill University's Dr. Max Dunbar. Now, as you know, the Antarctic and the Arctic climates turned cold some time ago, and it's natural to suppose that this low temperature is the dominating factor in controlling the evolution of Arctic and Antarctic faunas. I've become convinced that this is not so, that in fact uh, animals adapt to low temperatures very easily indeed, and that the factors which really determine the amounts of life in the sea types of species and so on are based on far more complicated matters than just temperature. Matters of light penetration, of food supply to the surface, oscillation of the seasons and so on. The exchange of heat between the earth and the atmosphere is being studied at many centers. 
Dr. Sven Orvig of McGill University is deeply involved in this area. If we can change the characteristics of the polar regions, or if nature itself changes in such a way that the snow and ice disappear, then this heat loss would change dramatically. And the whole climate of the globe would change. And perhaps this is what happened in the past. From great masses of data on polar variations in the heat exchange, scientists are creating meaningful mathematical projections and simulating climatic changes on a computer to understand better the processes which regulate these changes and how and why they occur. To bring about more accurate long-term weather forecasts and to predict future trends in the climates of our continents. At the United States Army's Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory, Dr. Wilfred Weeks develops methods to predict the physical properties of sea ice in a given area, even before it forms. To do this, you have to understand both the oceanography and the meteorology and how the ice grows as a function of this. Lake ice, for example, is composed effectively of pure water in the solid state as ice. Sea ice, on the other hand, is composed of ice, but within these ice crystals are arranged tiny liquid inclusions of brine. These liquid inclusions are arranged in a very systematic and regular manner, and this pattern changes as the growth conditions change. The chief scientist at the laboratory, Dr. Andrew Assur, is deeply committed to solving the problems of polar engineering. The time is exciting, and we are getting more and more benefits out of the efforts we made 10, 15 years out. We know how to design engineering structures to withstand forces in ice-infested seas. One of these days, we are going to send the largest tankers right through the Arctic Ocean. We are going to supply both Europe and Asia with oil pouring out of the soil of Alaska. Oil pouring out of the soil of Alaska? It's already happening. An oil strike in the general area of Prudhoe Bay on the northern Alaskan coast is described as potentially one of the largest petroleum accumulations known to the world today. The oil is there, but the matter of getting it to the markets of the world brings up problems that private industry and government are joining forces to solve. The results of years of ice research by Dr. Waldo Lyon of the Navy's Undersea Warfare Center is now being used to develop giant tankers able to overcome the crushing pressures of frozen Arctic waters. To give us engineering data, we have been intensely engaged in the science of the freezing processes in the sea. Sea ice is the stuff with which we work daily, and we must understand it. And to do this, we have built a laboratory in which to grow sea ice and we study the crystalline structure, the ice bubble content, the brine cell content in relation to the mechanical strength of the ice. From the research laboratories and from oceanographers in the field, a mass of new knowledge about the polar regions is emerging. New knowledge, too, about how men of different nations can work together. In Antarctica, 12 countries have agreed to share their information and their facilities in a cooperative search for greater scientific understanding of this forbidding region. In the Arctic, scientists and oceanographers of the United States, Canada, and other nations are working closely together to study this vast frontier. The oceanographer of the Navy, Rear Admiral O.D. Waters, Jr., directs the Navy's oceanography program. 
and has a deep interest in polar oceanography. Oceanography in the polar regions is indeed of importance to the United States Navy. For defense purposes and the national security, we are vitally concerned with all aspects of the ocean environment. The Navy has a long history of supporting exploration and research in the Arctic and Antarctic. Scientists still must find the answers to many questions concerning the polar regions to speed the day when the oceans can be mastered for national defense and the welfare of mankind. These, then, are the polar regions, where the ice-locked secrets of the Earth are being yielded up to men who can force their way against the thousand knives and the screaming winds of sub-zero gales. Where once man took only a dog sled to seek out the unknown, today he comes to the polar regions seeking a new kind of conquest, as exciting and challenging as any man has ever known. where the weapons are those of modern technology. As they have for hundreds of years, our men are at work at the frontiers. Once they were called explorers. Now they are scientists, oceanographers. But the prize is still new knowledge for the benefit of their nation and for all of mankind.